Good morning once again and uh, welcome to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. Uh, our re regular tradition says that we must go through the newspapers every morning and see what major stories have made the headlines. And so this morning we will be doing the same. We've invited to join us uh, Mr. Ezekiel Nyayetok uh, to, of course, uh, have his quick review of these major stories. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Good morning. Always a pleasure to be on PLOS TV Africa. Good morning, Good to sir. See you. All right. Uh, we're kicking off with stories on the Punch newspapers this morning. We'll see as many of these stories as we can find and get to share with you and um, quickly also get to uh, go through them. The major one there you can see says, Sans Afenifere, back Akiri Dulu, false presidency, NEF disagrees. And um, of course, right as to that story, Akiri Dulu acting within his power, says Ali, don't politicize security, San tells the federal government. Federal government shunned Southwest governor's alarm on headsmen's uh, menace, says uh, YCE. And Afeni Afeni is speaking again, saying, Buhari shows no pretense that he is representing Fulani interests. All right. Nigeria overtakes U.S. as India's biggest oil supplier. Oshibajo demands sanctions for fraud, extortion, bribery in government agencies. And Biafra, above Kanu's capacity to decide, says Ohaneze. Of course, uh, there's a new um, president of Ohaneze in Uh We also have here 21 million subscribers still without NIN, says Telcos. Also on the Punch newspapers this morning, Ikiti establishes 5 billion naira snail farm, projects 6 billion naira annual profit. And of course, uh, Joe Biden demands end to divisions, signs executive order reversing Trump's policies. Uh, Edo NDLEA seizes 15,253 kilograms of uh, cannabis, cocaine, and tramadol, and 10 cars. And also, Mena bail request to evade trial and flee to the U.S., says the EFCC. Those are the big ones that we can find uh, here this morning, um, and we're going to go straight into it, Mr. Nyaya Talk. Let's let's have you quickly uh, speak on maybe two of these stories. Okay, um, so many, but let's look at um, the first: uh, the demand for sanctions by uh, Mr. Vice President. I find that extremely instructive because the rot in the civil service is the fleecing, the 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 the, the rate at which they. There is corruption at a monumental level. Is is something that this government cannot say they are not aware. Almost everything is either overpriced or there is. I mean, just anything you want to get from the system as far as the civil service is concerned. Virtually anything. It's either you've got to pay for it, whether it has to do with employment or it has to do with um, projects that are that are just. Um, Look at what happened not long ago about the rail, um, the, 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 the African Development Bank rate, what obtains in other parts of the country, of, of the, of the um, continent, like Morocco and the rest, and what we are doing in Nigeria. And the world is a global village, all these things. And, you know, costing is, is, is a statute of general application, unless you bring in what you may call location factor. But in... in, 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 in Besides that, other variables are things that you, you can just impute very easily. So why must we run these systems that are so opaque? There's no openness, there's no transparency, and the fastest way to corruption is secrecy. And I think the time has come when we should be tired. We should be really, really tired. And secondly, with all the corruption that we have, Look at the civil service. Look at the civil, the sectors. Look at you know the things that have happened. How many people have been brought to book? You know, um, we give us the impression that nothing is really going wrong in this country. So if Mr. Vice President is saying, "Look, let us interrogate this and them on the consequences and sanctions," please, we we don't want to hear. We just want to see what Mr. Vice President has done. Mr. Just talk. bring some level. Ms. Ayatok, you know, you know, so that we can move to the next story. I, I just want to also quickly ask you to speak on this. Same thing. Yeah. We, we live in a, in a country where stories like this would excite Nigerians. Maybe a few. Yeah. 
um, yeah. is the same country where every now and then we hear that the president has given orders to security agencies to you know take you know control of a certain area or do you know do their job. Shouldn't we have systems that work to checkmate corruption? Shouldn't we have systems in place in public agencies in in MDAs across the country that? Checkmate corruption. Do, do we always need to have these sensitive, sweet stories, you know, from people in, in positions of power asking that, you know, there should be sanctions? Shouldn't it be instead that every single system that should work to checkmate corruption must be fixed so that these things don't happen? Because it, it, it doesn't seem, you know, th these are just very sweet statements and it doesn't seem like anything would change if we don't fix the systems. You, you, you see, um, with all due respect to Mr. Vice President, and I can feel his pains, but Mr. Pre Vice President is not, is not unaware of how the system runs. Mm. He, he, I can't know it more than him. He, he's been an attorney general, and he's been Mr. Vice President. He knows how the system is run. He knows how the politics run. He knows who funds the system. He knows that if you are the head of any agency or personal, the level of pressure put on you from parties. You know, I run one of the most, most um, what's the word, most of influential WhatsApp groups in Nigeria where you have governors, senators, ministers. You have virtually everybody that I have direct access to. Over 90% of the heads of agencies in this country. I sit down one-on-one -on -one with them and the pressure that is mounted on them to bring money is obscene. And they all know it. We all know it. I'm not saying something that no Nigerian knows. We all know it. Why don't we interrogate our political system and draw a fine line between politics and governance? All Let right. me even say this. I'm going to say something that is going to sound very controversial, but I think that if Nigerians can get 80% of the returns on good grounds, we'll be better off. Right now, we're getting less than 20%. All Why right. don't we just Let's... say, okay, political system, Take 20%, take 10%. Run your policy. Let's, let's quickly also... All right, let, let's also quickly speak on... I, I think we should move to the next paper. Hopefully the uh, Akere Dolu and Ondo State um, federal government drama might come up you know, in the next paper, and you can speak on that also. All right, so let's uh, now turn to the Nation newspaper. It says, Presidency, Ondo governors, headers, eviction row grows. It says lawyers and groups back at Kiridulu, North elders ask headsmen to stay. Bandits to drop arms after Pali with Gumi and police. Nigeria's debts may hit 60 trillion naira, and that's according to uh, the Minister of Finance. Uh, X SGF Babachi Lawal's trial begins afresh. Bandits are enemies, says Makinde. Igbo demands justice in United Nigeria. That's Ohanese warning. Federal Executive Council okays 65 years exit age and more pay for teachers. And here's a COVID-19 situation in the country. Two Oshu Exco members test positive. Kano laments tougher second wave. Lagos tests 264,000 so far for virus and more deaths in Edo, more cases and deaths in Edo state. Also, we have this one here about uh, the US. Stop extremism and racism, Biden tells Americans. And final verification of the defunct Nigeria Airways workers begin. Ms. Ayetok. These are the stories yes, on the top Lord. page of the Nation newspaper this yeah. morning. Which of them would you like to address? Um, two of them in particular. The first is um, the, the, the Federal Executive Council um, okay extension in um, retirement age for teachers in particular. I, I want to really hail Mr. President for this decision because I've come here and knocked the presidency, I mean, time and time again, that they, act, they lack tact and strategy in the way they operate. But this is one policy that I will give my 100% nod to. If you look at me right now, I'm three years away from 60, and I think all my faculties are as sharp as can be. So somebody to tell me that as a teacher in three years, I'll be retiring. I'll just be wondering why you would have wasted a major resource. So I think that a lot of teachers are not far from me at 60. They are still, they are still waxing strong. Actually, one of my classmates just retired at 60, 
And, and it pains me because, I mean, this is a guy that is so sound, so cerebral, has so much to do. He's gained so much experience. And now he's going to look for what to do outside of what he's been doing just because he's 60. So I want to say that what Mr. Vi Mr. President has done is awesome. And I agree with him. And um, I know that people say, oh, let them come out so that they can create room for others to be employed. That mentality has got to change where we should look at employment generation to be something that is born out of the MSMEs and not out of employment in the government. Let us look at entrepreneurship. I had a talk with the Vice Chancellor of um, Akwaibo State University here um, some days back, and I was so excited on what he's trying to bring on board with respect to entrepreneurship, you know, and, you know, he, he, I wish, um, I hope I'm not letting the, the cat out of the bag, that this man is coming with ideas that will just completely revolutionize the, 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 the academic curriculum. I'm bringing, he said something that I found very interesting. He said, tell a child, about you know botanical names and things like that and you lose him but tell that young person that you know from this flower you can extract you know something that can make perfume he, he immediately kind of lightens up because he sees money young people want to be taught things that they can see the end thereof so with such a thing you can see a revolution is coming into our educational system and if we follow that it will be really good so fake, I give them. Then the next one I'd like to really talk about for some time, um, because of time, is Mr. Biden. I, yesterday, as I was watching Mr. Biden, I couldn't feel more sorry for him than anybody in the world. You know, he says, stop, uh, you know, uh, racism and um, the extremism and all those things. You see, they, 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 uh, I, I, there's no time that I would have liked to do certain analysis that for now, let's leave it as it is, but... I honestly, sincerely do not envy Mr. Biden because when I was contesting election, one of the hashtags that I had was shut down and shut out. When you want to come out and become Mr. World, you were not elected as the president or DG or WTO. You are elected as president of United States of America. And the America first you know, policy of Mr. Trump if Biden is not careful at a time like this that the resources are getting more scarce, he should ask himself, why do the world want me? Do they want me for me and my people? Or do they want me for them? If he's not careful, when the Americans have started to taste the sweet um, aroma of you know, protecting them, putting America first, if he's not careful, he will neither be useful to the outside world nor to the Americans, and Trump is going to thereby decide to trump every single decision he takes. And he's got to surround himself with the most cerebral, the wisest, and the most diplomatic people who are going to trade the world, not in exchange for America, but put America first and yet be a part of the global world. He needs, he needs to balance that very, very delicate line. Anyway, right. that's it for Biden. All right, thank you so much. Uh, let's now bring in uh, the next paper. Sorry, Gabe. Uh, yeah, the, uh, that should be the Guardian newspapers this morning. This is what we can also quickly find um, over there. Um, well, it's a statement that we've heard before here in Nigeria in 2015. Uh, it says, I will be president for all, says Joe Biden. If you remember, um, I belong to no one and I belong to everyone. It's pretty similar. Also, editorial federalism is the answer, after all. Also on The Guardian, opera over Ondo quit notice to criminal headers. And we also can find on The Guardian, booking system malfunctions as crowds return for NIN enrollment. Leaked memo alleges monumental graft at NSCDC, NIS, and others. An FEC okays teacher's retirement age bill, $1.484 billion to electrify Calabar um, free trade zone. And also, police apologize to Nigerians over SARS operative uh, excesses and uh, protest. Uh, Kuka writes Belo and Balewa over state of the nation. That's also on the Guardian newspapers this morning. That's all we can take. So let's quickly get into it. Um, one or two that you can quickly speak on. Reverend Kuka has my highest level of respect. I just want to dub my heart for Father Kuka. That said, you go to NIM, and I've said it time and time again, please let the government prioritize the life of Nigerians. 
the SIM registration is extremely important, extremely important, I agree with you. But the methodology, we must not in trying to, you know, create or solve a problem, create a bigger problem. Life first, that is what we must look at. So the question is, if we are not going to have crowd, what can we do in the next, I said this last week, and I'll repeat it, what can we do in the next two weeks that can be off the crowd, offline? This issue of come and book, then we give you a date, we come, it's like we are living in space. This is Nigeria, come on, come on. Can we, I said this before and I repeat it. One of the biggest important points to any human being is his money. The banks have our biometric details. Can we start with the bank and say, everybody that has a bank account verified, let us take this bank, synchronize it with our NAM, and give you back, you know, with your BVN, give you an NAM. So anybody that has a BVN, number one, will have an instant NIM, not even phone number, but everybody that has BVN. That is the most sensitive thing to every Nigeria, his money. Why don't we synchronize the BVN? If you have a BVN, don't just bother, just wait at home. We'll get back to you if you have a BVN. You know, that is number one. When we have finished that, we see the number that we have taken out. If you have an international passport, that's number two. Stay at home, we'll get back to you. We now see how the, the interface between the two the technologies can work so that you generate the BVN and send to them. Number three, now driver's license is not as authentic as, BV, as a BVN or international passport, okay? So when you've taken these two out, you now reduce the crowd because virtually everybody in that place has a bank account. You take the crowd out, at least in the cities, then let's think in terms of the rural areas who don't have bank accounts. How can we deal with it? Because this thing of deadline, I agree with the deadline, but there should be a more strategic way of getting about that. Then when you look at, uh, I don't know how much time we have about the quick notice of... Um, you, of can, you can quickly talk on that before we go. I'll tell you that, yes. Now, the, you know, people have started calling me chapter two, but I couldn't quote this enough. Chapter two... Section 14, subsection 2B of our constitution says that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. And every state governor is put there to secure his people. Now in Ondo State, land, uh, Ondo State, yes, land belongs to the state. And what this man has said is for the reserve areas, please leave. There are other areas. Let's start from where I have control over. This place was set for a particular purpose. You cannot go there and be grazing there. So for these reserve areas, please leave it alone. And then, Mr. President, let me end on this. When my, my brother, uh, Mr. Jonathan, was uh, the, the, the president, you know, there was this, you know, body language, so to speak, in Hilton with the Niger Deltans. I called my people one day and said, we need to be careful how we enjoy this, our brother in government, because the maximum of eight years, you didn't even have the eight years, so that you don't take yourself to a level where you cannot sustain. I caution my Niger Delta brothers. Mr. President needs to know that he has less than three years, two years to be on the seat, and that he might inadvertently bring tears and sorrows to his people, the, the Fulanis, who have been with us. I don't know, there are two Fulanis, the, the, Outside Fulanis, I'm not talking about them. The Nigerian Fulanis, they are our brothers, they are us. So let us have policies that make sure that there's integration, that make sure there's love, that make sure there's unity, that make sure that after long, after, uh, long after the music has stopped, the melody lingers. Let us ask the melody that is going to linger between the Fulanis and Nigerians after Mr. President has left. All right. I think it is strategically unwise to want to seemingly protect them against the others. It should be wiser for him to play this good politics of brotherliness, brotherhood, and you know, you know, good neighborliness, and not to be seen as a defender of the of the, the full armies. Because right, when he's Mr. gone, Antok. they're our brothers. Okay. Um, we're out of time. Thank you very much, as always, for uh, your time and for sharing your thoughts with us on these major stories. Uh, looking forward it's to seeing you again. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me.
as always. All right, um, stay with us. Uh, we're moving next to talking about what happened today in history. I'm going as far back as 1908. Yes. Uh, the conversation about women and, uh, you know, how society maybe has been unfair to them, you know, dates back to, you know, centuries ago. So, you know, one of the stories we'll be sharing today in history is about that. Yes, and another one would be more recent history, the COVID-19 pandemic that has affected much of the world. And uh, we'll be talking about that on Today in History after the break.